clock has started. Good morning and welcome back to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston for a second in a series of three briefings today, all talking about NASA's Boeing crew flight test. This mission is a flight test of the Boeing Starliner spacecraft scheduled to launch in early May with our two NASA astronauts, Sonny Williams and Butch Wilmore. Our briefing today will focus on the details of that mission. Our guests here with us today will discuss the timeline and all phases of flight that they'll be keeping an eye on. Here with us today, we have Mike Lammers, Starliner Ascent Flight Director, Ed Van Sice, Starliner Rendezvous Flight Director, and Vincent LaCourt, International Space Station Flight Director. We'll be taking some questions here in the room, on the phone, and on social media. If you're joining us from the phone bridge, please press star one to enter our question queue. And on social media, if you have a question, please use hashtag AskNASA. Uh, when you're asking your question, uh, please state your name and media affiliation, as well as who you would like to address your question to. But first, we're going to start off with some opening remarks. I'll kick it off with Mike Lammers. Okay. Thank you, Chelsea. Again, I'm, uh, I'm Mike Lammers. I've, uh, I've been a flight director in Houston for about 15 years and a number of programs. But uh, today, I'm kind of excited to come talk to you as the Starliner flight director. I'm the lead flight director, and I also uh, do the ascent uh, phase of the flight. And uh, in that role, I, um, I lead the Boeing and ULA uh, United Launch Alliance uh, operations team that gets the, uh, the crew uh, both uh, into the vehicle pre-launch as well as uh, gets them into space. And uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's been a culmination of a number of years of developing how this uh, flight system works with Boeing and United Launch Alliance as well as uh, developing procedures, operation techniques, and training, uh, especially here at the end where we go through a lot of the details of the mission. And it's, uh, it's, it's really just uh, outstanding to, to talk to you about it. And I know we're all, we're all really um, excited to get into the details of the mission. Um, just up top, uh, again, we're, we're targeting launch to be early May. And we will uh, have a rendezvous uh, 24 hours later and we're going to do a minimum of an eight-day mission and test flight. And I stress it's, it's a test flight, right? Um, the, the mission is to uh, shake down the vehicle with the crew on board. We've flown it twice before, but this will be the first time with the crew when we want to learn about it and, uh, and make it available as a tool um, to uh, transport crew up and down to the International Space Station. Um, again, it's uh, targeting a minimum of an eight-day mission, but the total length is going to be defined by uh, orbital mechanics and uh, the weather at our landing locations, which are in the southwest United States. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Again, I'm here with, uh, with Ed and um, Vincent. What we're going to do is we'll talk about each phase of flight. I'll start with ascent. Ed will go into the rendezvous. Vincent will talk about what, what we're doing docked. Then I'll hand back over to me. I'll go through uh, kind of the landing phase, and then um, we'll get into questions. Um, again, real happy to go into all sorts of detail. We, we, we live and breathe this stuff. So um, if you have any questions or things that you want more amplification on, we're, we're more than happy to go into that. Um, so what I'll do is I'll talk verbally a little bit uh, before we go into the video. But I'm going to start with uh, the day before launch. Uh, the way this system works is uh, the, the vehicle is going to be stacked on the Atlas V at, the, um, at what we call the VIF, uh, the Vertical Integration Facility, I believe that stands for, out at uh, Pad 41. And uh, <clears throat> the day before launch in the morning, uh, the stack 
uh, will be rolled out to the launch pad, brought down hard on the launch pad, and uh, they'll um, <clears throat> do some checkouts. And then um, we have a Boeing team in Florida at the Boeing Mission, uh, BMCC, Boeing Mission Control Center. They uh, actually handle, they're the team of uh, engineers and technicians that do all the uh, integration and test of the spacecraft. They power up the spacecraft, power it up and down all the time. In fact, um, just over these last few days, they've been doing that to fuel the spacecraft. Um, they will uh, power up the spacecraft. My team uh, in Houston uh, will come on and um, watch with that, as well as uh, the Boeing engineering team that's, that's based in Houston will be uh, right down the hall from me. And uh, we'll bring the vehicle up, we'll do some checkouts, we'll make sure it can communicate through TDRIS and the uh, communications network, and uh, do some uh, file uplinks to the vehicle and just generally make sure it's ready for launch. The next day we'll also do a briefing for the crew just to give them um, uh, uh, um, any last minute things that may have come up and kind of a look at the, wet, the weather. Um, what we're gonna do uh, on launch day is uh, Butch and Sonny um, will uh, we'll wake up on launch day, go through some of their preliminary activities. They're turned over to Boeing at um, about four and a half hours before flight, right? Then uh, Boeing manages um, all the crew activities, both to get them ready and out to the pad. At that time, we'll do a, um, we'll do a, uh, uh, basically a weather check with the crew. I'll run a, a weather briefing with them, and then they'll go ahead and go into the suit room and get uh, suited up with the, the Boeing and uh, David Clark technicians that do that. Um, as the crew is getting ready, um, the Boeing team in Florida will do the final activation of the spacecraft, and that involves uh, bringing the propulsion system up to pressure and activate it, and then they're ready to turn it over to the team um, in Houston who will manage the spacecraft. Keep in mind that the way that this system works is we've got the spacecraft managed from Houston in flight, and then of course the launch vehicle is, um, is um, uh, uh, activated and uh, run in Florida until we hit the point of launch. Um, at four hours before launch, again, we're gonna hand over to Houston a little bit different than Shuttle and Artemis. We manage a lot of the last um, uh, activities as far as commanding to the spacecraft actually from Houston. Um, the, uh, there's also, uh, besides that Boeing team in Houston and Florida, we also have a small team in Denver that works for United Launch Alliance that handles um, what gives me some information on what the rocket is gonna be doing um, during flight. So we're all coordinating. Um, the crew arrives at the pad, uh, two hours and 50 minutes before launch. They'll go up to uh, the white room. You'll see the pad techs uh, help them strap in. That process takes a little bit over an hour. Um, they'll start closing the hatch um, at uh, one hour and 20 minutes um, before flight. I should note too that the, the rocket is actually fully fueled uh, before the crew gets out there. So that's one of the last things we do is we load um, the rocket with the cryogenic uh, propulsion um, while we um, suit up the crew. Again, we're at uh, an hour and 20 before launch. We'll get the crew in and then uh, the, get the hatch closed. We'll do a leak check on the spacecraft and the pad team will clear the pad um, about 50 minutes before launch. Okay, the real meat of the countdown where you'll hear a lot of things um, on, the, on the audio that they provide. That's um, at uh, L minus 18 minutes, we'll begin the uh, transfer to internal power. That's where we go from the external um, power to the onboard batteries. That's commanded from Houston. You'll hear some comm checks um, between the crew and the uh, ULA launch conductor, Doug Lebo, um, a number of poles going through the count, and then uh, re um, in the final four minutes, uh, you'll hear the uh, launch conductor uh, give the crew an instruction to do a switch throw called last arm to auto, That'll, uh, that's last as the launch abort system. The crew will arm the abort system at 75 seconds and then uh, they'll go ahead and launch. Okay, so uh, it's already been a, a busy day, but uh, now we have liftoff. So that's where my real work starts. Um, this is gonna be the first um, crewed ascent that's been flown um, out of mission control in Houston uh, since the STS-135 in 2011. Um, can we go ahead and roll the first video? I'll just talk for about a minute and a half through the ascent activities on the Atlas V. 
the animation asset. Okay, again, we've got the uh, Atlas V on the pad. Crew access arms are tracked at uh, 11 minutes, by the way. So there's a uh, liftoff from pad 41. Okay, on the Atlas V, most of your energy to make orbit actually comes from the uh, first stage with those uh, two SRBs and the RD-180 um, engine. Actually, one of the first things you'll hear from the crew here is roll program. Uh, while we're going through ascent, looking forward to hearing Butch talk to us right off the pad. Again, uh, RD-180's got two engine bells. That's actually a single engine there in the first stage. First stage will burn, um, the SRBs will burn for about a minute and a half. You'll see them burn out. We actually carry the empty casings for another minute. It goes a little faster in the video, but we got to get above the atmosphere to jettison them. Uh, we'll get through first stage at four and a half minutes. There's about a 15 second pause as the first stage separates. That's the ascent cover that covers the docking system. It'll be jettisoned and the aero skirt will jettison as well. Um, and then the uh, two RL-10s on the Centaur will take us on a nice, um, easy cruise to space. That'll take us uh, up to about 12 minutes into the mission. Miko is 12 minutes. We'll stay on the booster for about three minutes and then we'll have a separation at 15 minutes into the mission. Again, we're suborbital still here. Um, we got to do another burn. Starliner's actually got a pretty spectacular uh, orbital maneuvering system. You'll see the four engines kick in there. We'll do that at 31 minutes into the mission and that'll push the crew into orbit and uh, get, a, get them heading on to uh, rendezvous. Okay, so with that, as in the real world, uh, we do one more burn at an hour and 15 minutes, but then uh, I had it, hand it over to Ed and his rendezvous team. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, my name is Ed Van Sice, and I've been a flight director since uh, class of 2009, certified in 2010, so like Mike, about 14 or 15 years as a flight director. Experience um, International Space Station, um, Artemis One a little bit, uh, Gateway flight director for, uh, for about a year, lots of projects inside the space station. Um, and then I've been working Starliner since uh, 2016, so really all three of us uh, up here have uh, maybe different uh, exact projects that we've worked on, but we all have uh, significant experience across multiple programs for the agency, and also been working Starliner for, for quite some time. It's been really uh, an honor uh, and actually humbling to be able to work on Starliner from the days of when it was a PowerPoint uh, presentation all the way up now to having two flights behind us and getting ready to go put crew into orbit on, uh, on this third flight. Um, the, the teams that we get to work with are, are truly amazing and highly capable in everything that they do and uh, getting to be at the forefront of leading the teams, uh, not just the flight controllers but, uh, and, and the real-time engineering teams as well, but all the, uh, all the folks that are working in the factory and uh, with ULA and, and all the other organizations we work with and of course with NASA as well and the commercial crew program and, and the ISS program. Just having that um, uh, capability and, and experience is, is just quite a pleasure. Um, like Mike said, we're, we're getting ready to um, put this vehicle and this crew through a test flight and uh, various phases of, of a test. So that's what you're going to uh, hear a lot about as we are um, working through the missions. Obviously the primary goal is to get the crew up to the space station and get them uh, back home to uh, the southwest U.S. safely. Um, but in that process, we are doing a lot of, purposefully doing a lot of tests of the vehicle as you would with the test flight uh, of an aircraft or anything else. Um, so you'll, you'll hear a lot about, uh, from Vincent, you'll hear a lot about different test things that we're going to do while we're docked. But we also want to put the vehicle through some, um, some experiences that we don't anticipate being needed on a, on a normal six-month mission to the space station. But we know the vehicle should be capable of handling them if the crew were to, to need them. And so we want to check them out on this uh, test flight as well, um, just to be able to say that, yes, uh, not only the, the normal mission will go fine, but then all of the capabilities the vehicle has on uh, maybe not a good day, um, all of those work as well. So that's going to be uh, the focus of the bulk of the crew's afternoon um, after launch. So they, uh, they got up early. They went through everything that Mike just described. Now they're in space. They just completed the, the first uh, co-elliptic burn. Um, and you'd think that now it's just a, a great relaxing ride to the space station. And it will be uh, for that six-month um, increment mission. But uh, like I said, we're putting the crew right to work, um, getting them out of their seats, out of their suits, and then right into some demonstrations. 
and we will be doing a bunch of things with the spacecraft um, to make sure that it can uh, help the crew and the crew can also uh, maneuver the spacecraft as they need to. So we'll be doing things like um, purposefully pointing it um, in, a, in an orientation that's, uh, say, not exactly the, the nominal, the normal orientation for the mission, and then having the crew manually fly the spacecraft back into the, the direction it should be pointing. Um, we also want to make sure that if for some reason the vehicle doesn't know where the communication satellites are located, that the crew can um, manually uh, fly the spacecraft to point the antennas at the satellite. Um, uh, another, another thing that we'll be doing this day is um, tricking, if you will, the spacecraft into thinking that it doesn't know where it is in space. So we're going to um, deallocate a couple of its um, inertial measurement systems to, uh, they're still running, but the vehicle computers are not actually um, looking at them. So effectively, the, the computers don't necessarily know where they are. And then the crew will manually fly the spacecraft to look at stars and use our star tracker to then rebuild um, its inertial navigation base. And we'll see how their manual, manual way of doing it compares with what um, the still running um, computers are, are seeing and see how well that compares. And they should all compare very equally and um, we should be able to run off of that solution that the crew comes up with. But again, it's a test flight, so we want to see how well the vehicle does in all these scenarios that we've thoroughly tested out on the ground with all our avionics um, systems down here, but we want to see how the spacecraft is uh, really performing. Uh, and one other final thing that we'll be doing is uh, we're putting all, all of our thrusters um, through a a uh, human manual flying checkout. So we want to make sure that not only can we point in space, but also can we do translations as well. So uh, if we're close to the space station and the computers have a hard time controlling Starliner, we want to make sure the astronauts can manually fly away. And to ensure we have that capability, we're going to um, give the crew full manual control uh, on this first day and just test everything out. So we'll uh, do some demonstrations of that. Um, and that last part is really important for the safety of the space station, so we have that manual capability. And we talked about the, um, the engineering teams that are here in Houston, the ones that are in Florida as well, and the other NASA programs involved. We're going to take a look at all this data while the crew is sleeping and have um, the, the Boeing teams that, that we're embedded with will take a look at all that data, bring recommendations to our mission management team, and ultimately take that to NASA to certify that uh, this manual flying capability is also something we're ready to use in proximity to the space station um, if we were to need it. So all that's happening while the crew's asleep, and then they'll wake up the next morning, and we can go ahead and um, show the video here for um, the free flight and the orbit. Um, so this is kind of the end of the crew's day. There, this is the kind of representation of what they're doing at the, um, uh, in those tests that I was talking about. So we're pointing the nose towards the Earth trying to see uh, where we are with respect to the communication satellites. We also fly in this tail to the sun attitude, so our, our solar arrays are at the, the back of the Starliner, so we want to make sure we keep those uh, pointed at the sun. But the crew's inside there, and um, they're getting ready for bed, and uh, we'll do some more checkouts overnight while they're sleeping. They'll wake up in the morning. We'll be pretty close, uh, you know, a couple, um, couple thousand kilometers away from ISS, and uh, do a rendezvous that was exactly the same automated rendezvous we did for the last flight. Uh, we'll fly up underneath the space station and then around out in front. And uh, we'll, we'll actually pause a little bit out in front of the space station, do some more manual flying, uh, just to make sure that's exactly the way that the crew expects it. Then we'll press in, and at 10 meters, uh, we'll do our final approach and uh, dock. And then Sonny and Butch will get to uh, get everything situated inside the cabin and get ready to come into their new home for the next few days. And uh, Vincent's the expert on the space station side, so I'll hand it over to him to explain all that to you. Thanks, Ed. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vincent LaCord. I'm the lead um, International Space Station Flight Director for CFT. I was selected into the office in 2015. I'm going to walk through our dock time frame with the International Space Station. Um, our main goals of the dock mission are a few. There's to practice and validate the planned operations. Uh, for long duration missions. We're also going to perform some contingency operations just in case we were ever to need those in contingencies. And then we'll do some cargo operations. Um, our lead planners, who are Richie Chantlos and Izzy Lasky, did a great job of trying to fit all the puzzle pieces together 
and have figured out that we can do our mission in a minimum of eight dock days. So we have a few graphics I'm going to show you to kind of show you how the mission will look day by day. So the first of all, um, just as Mike said, we usually dock about 24 hours after launch. Um, once you arrive and dock to the space station, you're going to get, uh, the crew is going to um, egress, get out of their um, ascent and entry suits. Then they're going to um, re de uh, repress the vestibules and be able to open the hatches, and then they'll go on to the space station, and we'll have our welcome ceremony that you'll get to watch on NASA TV. Then the ISIS crew members conduct a safety briefing where they'll be able to take Butch and Sonny and remind them of where all the emergency hardware lives on the International Space Station in case we have any contingencies when they're on board. Now let's go ahead and go to flight day three, which is dock day number two. On this day, we're unloading all of the cargo and we're also configuring the vehicle for quiescent operations. If you can imagine when, you're, when the Starliner is there for six months, you don't want to use all the power and leave all of your equipment running the whole time. So what the Quiescent Ops does is it basically powers off all the redundant equipment that you don't really need. The crew will still be able to go inside the capsule. They have good lights, good displays, good ventilation, things like that. But all of the extra computers and stuff like that will be powered off. Um, we'll also get to do some emergency hardware transfer, um, getting ready again for some of the contingency operations that we're going to practice later in the mission. Let's go again to dock day number three. On dock day number three, we're going to do some of our operational checkouts. Um, the first main one we're going to do is called our safe haven checkout. Um, if you can imagine if you have an emergency on ISS, you want to be able to get in your earth return vehicle, isolate yourself, and make sure you're in a safe environment. So that's what we'll practice. Uh, Butch and Sonny will go into uh, Starliner. They'll close the hatch. They'll basically completely power up the vehicle on their own to practice if they were getting ready for an emergency um, undock and return. So we'll basically make sure all that all that stuff works um, in a kind of a steady environment. Um, on entry, we have a system called a sublimator that provides cooling for the vehicle that uses water. If for some reason there's any kind of leak or any kind of um, where we need additional water, we have the capability to refill that on board, um, even though you normally would not need to do that. So we'll get to practice that, again, just to make sure all the hardware connects correctly, make sure all the procedures are accurate. So that way, if we need that in a contingency, we're ready for that. Um, on the long duration mission, we'll have four crew members. And so what we'll do is we'll borrow a few ISIS crew members, have them float into Starliner with Butch and Sonny, and we'll practice that, that day of free flight to see how would we orient ourselves with four crew members. So we'll get to practice that before the, the long duration mission. And then we'll get to do a Boeing event where we'll have um, all of the engineers and employees who worked really hard to get Starliner on board, they'll get to interact with the crew and spend some time with them and see all that great hardware they built in space. We'll go to the next day, dock day number four. So usually seven in the six-month mission, seven days before the mission ends, you'll take that quiescent config and do a complete power-up and basically check out all the missions, systems, to make sure all the computers come on, make sure all the, the equipment is working. We're basically going to test that out on dock day number four. Butch and Sonny will basically sit in the capsule and watch all of the displays and watch all the units come up, so that way they can understand how all the systems are working. Now let's go to flight day number six, which is dock day number five. We put this sample day in there. As Mike said, orbital dynamics will really drive um, what day we're able to undock. So if it's longer than the eight-day mission, um, this is one of the days we'll put in. So we'll give the crew a half day off. Again, they're very busy on all these days, so they'll get a little bit of rest. We've also trained Butch and Sonny to be able to do um, basically all of the key International Space Station tasks that could exist for them. So they're ready for any preventive maintenance, corrective maintenance tasks, as well as a lot of science tasks. So we'll, we'll ask the space station program uh, what extra activities are available, and Butch and Sonny will go back to their International Space Station lives on their previous missions and get to do some of those tasks that they um, remember doing. Let's see, let's go to dock day number six. At this point, we're really now focused on the end of the mission. So we're going to load all the cargo that's going to come home on the Starliner and start some of that undock preparations. That emergency equipment that was in Starliner, we'll now take that out and put it back on the, the ISS where it lives. Um, one of the other training simulations we fly on Starliner is um, on entry, it's all automated, but there is the capability that if needed, the crew can take manual control and fly an entry. 
Um, for Butch, he's just going to practice that right before a launch, so he doesn't need a lot of practice. But on a six-month mission, you want the crew to be able to, to get in that simulator and really practice those entries to make sure they're ready um, in case they need it. We'll get to practice that um, on dock day number six. Let's go to the next day. Now we'll really do a full undock power-up, make sure the vehicle is completely ready. We're going to have a conference with the crew to walk through um, all of their flight test objectives, make sure they give us feedback, so that way if we need to adjust any procedures or adjust any hardware, we can do that before Starliner 1. And then we'll have our standard departure news conference. Then we go to our next day. What we did is we went ahead and put in um, a sleep shift day because again, because of order dynamics, you don't always get to undock at the same time of day. So this will give us a chance to uh, sleep shift the crew for any, um, any time we need. And then we go to dock day number nine, which will be our last day on the International Space Station. Um, we'll get to do our farewell TV events. Um, the crew will get in their ascent entry suit. We'll close the hatch um, and then we'll get ready to leave. And at this point, we'll hand back over to Mike who will kind of walk you through the operations of how you undock um, and how you entry and land. Okay, thank you, Vincent. So um, again, we mentioned uh, where we are now is we're, un we're on undocking day and the crew is in the vehicle. Um, I'll show a short video here in a second, but uh, undocking happens about uh, six and a half hours prior to landing. Um, that's uh, a little bit longer on this test flight than it would be for a um, uh, uh, direct descent mission at the end of a six-month increment. We added some time uh, for the crew to do a couple more flight tests, and these are really uh, important ones. Starliner is really unique in that it has um, a backup system. We call it a backup system where the crew, you know, they have a rotational and a translational hand controller, and they normally go through uh, three uh, flight computers that fly the vehicle um, automated. But as it turns out, uh, we can uh, have the crew engage uh, backup control where they're actually firing, the, the commander can fire the jets directly bypassing the computers. And that's just designed so that if you had a really unlikely um, uh, computer failure, the crew can actually manually control the vehicle um, in this backup mode by what I like to call stick and rudder flying. Um, in fact, they can even deorbit and, and land in that mode. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend uh, about an orbit with the uh, uh, Butch engaging the various, um, uh, there's a couple of different jet manifolds that they can, they can uh, engage to get some experience flying and back up and just to make sure that, um, get some feedback on how the vehicle flies um, with respect to all the experience that he has both you know, in our training sims on the ground and then of course the other spacecraft and uh, even uh, aircraft that he's flown before. <clears throat> so again, we'll go ahead and do that um, over a couple of revs. We uh, do a deorbit burn and uh, you'll see this in the video, but we do a, a deorbit burn over the Pacific and we target a landing in the Southwest United States. We've got three landing areas. Um, White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. There's actually two spots that we can land there. It's a, it's a really uh, quite a big place, and uh, the uh, the other, and that's where the previous two Starliners have landed. Um, there's also a landing area at Wilcox Playa. That's uh, an area east of uh, Tucson, Arizona. It's actually just off of I-10, um, or uh, Dugway Proving Ground, which is uh, west of Salt Lake City, and that gives us kind of a spread, geographical spread that uh, allows us to uh, to uh, get opportunities every day, depending on where orbital mechanics. Uh, Puts us. So we'll go ahead, we'll roll the video here. This is only about a minute and then uh, we'll be finished. Okay, so there's uh, undocking. I think you'll see right after we undock, we back down the corridor. Uh, there's a cover that, this is a little early in the video, there's a cover that closes over the docking system. We fly a quarter lap, we get, go up over the zenith of ISS and then we do a departure burn. Um, I don't believe we show the deorbit burn here, but this is some of the uh, tests that we're doing with the uh, the backup control that I mentioned. Um, when we do the deorbit burn, it's pretty quick. It's less than a minute. And uh, the deorbit burn will happen. Um, the service module is separated. It does a disposal burn and it burns up um, over the Pacific. The capsule will go ahead and do a, a guided um, deorbit using its um, own propulsion system, which was activated shortly before this. 
Uh, landing sequence uh, begins at 30,000 feet. There goes the forward heat shield, and then we put out a couple of drogues. You'll see those jettison here in a second. Hopefully we'll have video from the NASA WB-57 for this when it happens. Uh, mains go out reefed at 8,000 feet, and then they'll uh, disreef three mains. And it takes about, uh, that's the bucket handle that gets us in the uh, correct um, attitude for landing. We're on the mains for about three minutes. You should see here in a second the forward heat shield is uh, dropped. And then the uh, airbags deploy. And uh, the crew touches down. And uh, the crew will uh, jettison the chutes manually. They do a switch throw that'll cause um, a lot of the vehicle systems to power down. Uh, we'll, well, as they power down, we'll uh, bring the crew up actually on a satellite phone. Uh, the landing team is uh, four kilometers on a on an offset on, on a on the edge of something we call the four kilometer circle, just to make sure that they're safe from um, the falling parts that are coming off the vehicle. There are things like mortar lids and those drogues that you saw before. Um, once the vehicle's on the ground, uh, that team will approach, and uh, they're actually on the sat phone call with uh, me and the and uh, the crew, and uh, they'll, we'll go ahead and uh, turn the vehicle over once they're um, at the location, and then they'll go ahead and make sure that uh, do the usual safety checks that you do around the capsule, and uh, they'll take the crew out, they'll do the medical checks, and then the crew will be uh, helicoptered. Uh, to a uh, landing field, and then they'll be flown back to Houston. So that's, uh, that is the mission summary. Great. Thank you so much. That was a huge wealth of information. Thank you to all of our briefers for that in-depth uh, going over of the timeline. Uh, we're going to switch over to some questions now. Uh, we're going to be taking questions here in the room, so if you have one, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll also be taking questions on our phone bridge, so if you are on the phone, go ahead and press star 1 if you've got a question for one of our briefers. Again, please state your name, affiliation, and who you'd like to address your question to. Uh, we can go ahead and start right here in the room. Hey, uh, Mike made Rogue Wall Street Journal. Not sure who this would go to. Steve and Mark talked a little bit earlier about how Boeing is using NASA flight ops for, for this mission. Uh, first of all, just to be crystal clear, that's you guys, that's your teams. And then second, um, could you talk a little bit about decision making during the mission, if there is an anomaly, given that, given NASA flight ops role and but Boeing's like ultimate responsibility and authority and management um, over CFD? How does decision-making work and something goes wrong? Thanks. Um, I'll, so I'll take a little bit of that, but I'll also let like Vincent to weigh in, too. Um, so what you really have up here, you have three members of uh, the Johnson Space Center Flight Operations Directorate um, that are NASA civil servants. But what you also have up here are two uh, Starliner Mission Operations Flight Directors that are operating out of the White Flight Control Room um, embedded with Boeing for design development test flight uh, mission execution of Starliner and you have one uh, space station flight director he's running uh, his flight Vincent's running his uh, team down in flight control room one um, just like space station 24 7 365 is being run from there and his focus and his uh, responsibilities are for the safety and protection of the space station and execution of the entire NASA mission. So I'll let, and I'll let him go into details on that. Um, versus our side of things is um, focused on the crew safety, vehicle safety, uh, mission success of the Starliner mission um, for and with Boeing. But also, of course, um, since we are providing a, a service to NASA and the commercial crew program, primary focus for us too is of course safety and, and mission success for the space station. So it is a, a partnership with Vincent and his team and NASA and the ISS team, uh, but there are some pretty clear distinctions. Um, so we have, uh, for those of you familiar with our operational products, we have flight rules, we have launch commit criteria that are Boeing products um, that tell us the limitations, um, the go no goes, things like that for Starliner that are uh, part of a uh, Boeing process. We, we work on developing those with our mission operations flight control teams, um, the mission engineer, or the Boeing engineers, and then the Boeing management, so Mark and Leroy that you talked with earlier. Um, and we get all those approved um, so that 
um, we know how to go operate in uh, the Starliner spacecraft at the nitty gritty level. Um, but we also then work with commercial crew program and ISS to ensure that what we're doing is within the requirements and and safety paradigm of, uh, of what NASA needs for really taking care of their astronauts, even though they're our friends, um, they're the NASA astronauts, we need to take good care of them. So that's, it is a collaboration, but there's still a distinction on the, the extent to which we're embedded within Boeing and, and their design and development and test versus um, Vincent's role. Caught you. Yeah, so I think from the International Space Station flight director role, it's very similar to how we do SpaceX, right? Once we get inside integrated operations, the International Space Station flight director has operational authority, and they're making the ultimate calls on, again, go, being go to dock, uh, go to undock, those kind of um, decisions. Um, the same way we would work with a SpaceX mission director, um, because they are the experts in the SpaceX capsule, the same way I'd work with Ed and Mike, um, that they're the expert in the Starliner capsule. So if there's any anomalies on the Starliner vehicle, again, my team is not the expert. We will listen to them and get their, get their advice, and then we have um, space, space station flight rules where we document if they have failure of X computer, are we still go or we not go based on what we're done and see what risk we will take. So again, in a lot of ways for us, we've practiced this for years, but it's very similar how we do other vehicles where again, my job is to make sure the ISS is in the right configuration for docking, make sure all of our systems are at the right redundancies, and then to communicate with Ed, Mike, uh, Chloe and Rick on, on their side to make sure that I understand um, the situation and what, what their vehicle is doing. Um, and again, the, the good news for us is we, we sit right down the hall from each other, right? So off console, it's very easy to work together and, and get um, good situation awareness on any anything they're working. Um, so that's the benefit, right, of working um, at Johnson Space Center where Boeing has, has contracted NASA to fly their vehicle. It's easier to be, sometimes easier to be on the same page because we do work at the same place and, and see each other all the time. Great, thank you. We'll take a question um, on the phone real quick. Marsha Dunn with the Associated Press. Hi, um, I'm wondering how long could the Starliner and its crew stay at the space station if something goes amiss during at then in the initial part of the flight? Are you taking up extra rations just in case? And is Boeing NASA working with SpaceX to be on emergency standby just in case? I'm just wondering the backup plans. Thanks. I can go to answer first, like the cargo. So we have, um, we basically bring a lot of supplies for the crew for, for kind of that initial uh, mission. We have some extended supplies in case they stay, but obviously ISS has, has plenty of uh, food and water, for example. So really we're prepared for them to stay as long as they need to. Obviously there's certain weather requirements that we need to meet on, on CFT. And so we have no issues if we need to stay, stay any longer. Yep. As far as um, duration goes, this this is there's really no hard constraint on the vehicle. This is the spacecraft that's designed to stay at space station for six months, and there's nothing essentially limiting that um, if you needed to. Um, as far as um, uh, being on standby, um, you know, those are um, I'm not aware of, of any of that. Okay, we're going to go to a question in the room. Go ahead. Hi, Elizabeth Powell from Space.com. Um, this is probably for Ed. So can you talk about during the close proximity operations to the ISS, aside from obviously the flight activities, the flight uh, test activities that Sonny and Butch are doing, are there any key differences with how a SpaceX uh, Dredgen close proximity operations goes? So I'm first going to admit that um, I've been focused on Starliner for a long time and have not been a, flight, a NASA flight director for a Crew Dragon mission. So I don't have tremendous depth of detail to really give you a point-by-point -point comparison. Um, but I have worked uh, a couple of Dragon cargo missions in, in previous years. So at, at a high level, um, the trajectories are basically the same. Because largely because of what Vincent described with the way that ISS wants to have vehicles approaching and the way they want to manage the traffic plans. So at a very high level, um, all the spacecraft that come up to the ISS are going to come up uh, from below and behind and then do some sort of uh, rendezvous. Uh, if you're docking to the forward part of ISS, obviously you'll go below, behind, in front, and then, and then kind of come up. 
Uh, the way that we do that with Starliner is a little bit different than uh, with the Dragon. So the profiles will look a little bit different just because um, the sensors that we use, the sensor suites for Rendezvous are all um, you know, different technologies, different way of doing things, different mission rules, um, different um, waypoints, if you will, to, to, to get on that trajectory. Um, the way that the space station is monitoring uh, the approaching vehicle is very similar. It's obviously not exactly the same, but it's very similar. Um, and then, largely, I, I, from that level, I can say that it's pretty close to the same. Um, I can't really do a good comparison for you on uh, you know, timeline of events or um, the, the manual capabilities and the manual actions the crews might be doing. Um, but from that perspective, it's, it's pretty, pretty similar. We'll take another question in the room. Hi, Irene Klotz with Aviation Week uh, from Mike. Uh, two questions. The first one is, um, considering the redundancy in Starliner, um, do all systems need to be operational to meet the launch commit criteria, or are you able to fly if uh, something is not operational? You can provide any detail on that. And then the second, just to clarify, again, the relationship between Boeing and NASA for the Starliner missions, for all intents and purposes, are you all sort of on leave from NASA on your official jobs and working as subcontractors to Boeing? So Boeing is your customer during these missions. You're no longer sort of representing NASA as you would if it wasn't a Starliner mission going on. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, uh, good questions. I'll. I'll take your second question first, because maybe here's here's a, another way of of of, of thinking about it. Um, and I realize that that it it can be um, it's challenging to describe sometimes the relationship. But I'll give it to you another way. When when I'm working Starliner, right, Ed and I, we actually have a charge code, right, and that 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 is um, um, you know funded by Boeing. I mean, ultimately, it's part of a NASA contract. But 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 it's it's being managed by Boeing and we're providing them service, right? And then that goes into even um, how the mission is run. When I report to the mission management team, the mission management team is chaired by Leroy Kane, who's a Boeing employee. Um, Boeing runs the mission until we get to the joint ops with 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 um, uh, Vincent, as he as he described. Um, then you know NASA's got an oversight role like they do for all of the. Of the vehicles, but but once if we're outside of this area around ISS, it's it's a Boeing run mission that is done um, in partnership with their customer, who is NASA. Um, <clears throat> as far as the launch commit criteria, you know, there's kind of two sets. There's the ones that um, ULA has, United Launch Alliance, on the Atlas V. Um, I'm not as familiar with those, except to say that they do their own set of checks. It's identical to all the commercial and government missions that, that they do for the rocket. Um, for the spacecraft, in general, all the systems um, have to be up and running. I think I could probably get into some details where there's there's some small things that we can um, fly without. I was just, you know, talking yesterday about about one criteria is how many, you know, the crew uses tablets for their procedures, right? And uh, we fly with four of them. Well, if Something happened to one of them. We can fly with three. So there's, there's, there's a few um, places where there's sufficient redundant systems you can go ahead and launch. But, uh, but in general, all the flight computers, all the IMUs, um, uh, have to be running to, to to launch. And we, I mean, we're evaluating those right down to uh, liftoff. Thank you, Mike. We're going to switch to a question on our phone bridge. Jeff Faust with Space News. Like one, is there uh, anything like the uh, dry dress rehearsal that uh, SpaceX does for Crew Dragon missions for Starliner? Uh, and then you mentioned the uh, timeline for undocking the landing is a little bit longer on CFT versus an operational mission. What would be the, the time from undocking to landing for an operational mission? Thanks. Um, let's see. For the... Uh the dry dress, the answer is um, yes. There is uh, uh, an activity, and I forget the ex exact date right now, but uh, it's about eight, it's, uh, it's uh, eight days before launch, seven or eight days before launch, and it's called the crew training activity. Um, it's uh, really a full up run 
um, where uh, the crew, uh, we, we have the whole team there, the crew um, suits up in the suit room, they get, get in the suits, we take them um, down to the spacecraft. The one difference is, is the, um, the spacecraft and the rocket aren't at the pad, they're in the VIF, the, the integration building. Um, but we, we have them practice out in the pad in the pad white room on some other activities. But the crew will get into the spacecraft. The spacecraft is going to be powered. Um, in fact, we're commanding it from Houston um, just as we would on launch day, and we go through the entire um, launch count, um, including things like uh, having the crew do suit checks, working with the pad team. Um, we'll do all of that and uh, get a chance to, to practice it. So that is being done and uh, is um, similar. It is a dry dress. Um, let's see, the second question was the uh, amount of time for a, a uh, uh, post-certification mission, as we call it, when, when Starliner is coming down. It would be the shortest possible time to get from undock to landing would be about four hours. Um, there's a little bit of a dependency on whether or not there's a fly around done. So Starliner's got the capability to do a full um, fly around of the entire space station to, to do photography of space station. Um, we're not doing that on this mission. Um, potential to do it on the next mission if NASA requests it. And if they do, it'd be, I think, closer to the six hours. Thank you. Got a question right here in the front. Houston Sari, ABC News for Matt. What are the weather and lighting constraints for landing? Was that, uh, so the question was uh, weather and lighting constraints. Um, the, um, the weather constraints for landing are we essentially want um, the lowest uh, wind that we can to, to undock. And, uh, um, and that's just to give a, 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 gentle, a gentler, um, um, not, not have a, a large lateral component when we hit the ground. Also, we do things um, like we account for um, if a parachute fails or an airbag fails, and so you tend to be a little bit more conservative. Right now, I think we, um, we want limits that are um, less than 10 knots for that. Um, and that kind of ties into the second part of your um, question, which was uh, lighting. Um, there are no requirements for lighting. Um, in fact, we tend to like to land at night, um, and that's because um, two reasons. Uh, one is the wind is lower at night in the places that we're landing. Also, um, you got to think about the safety of the um, of the people that go out and meet the spacecraft after it lands. Some of them are in things called scape suits, which are to protect them if there's a leak of, of um, fuel or oxidizer from the vehicle. They're actually pretty hot. And, you know, we land in the desert, and uh, so we, it's a lot easier on the landing team to land at night. And it turns out we found in previous missions, it's actually, um, I, when I started working this program years ago, we were a little bit worried about operating at night, but they've actually come up with a really nice setup um, with the lights. And, of course, if you see the, the video, we've got the infrared tracking, both from the ground and the, and the aircraft. It's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of funny. We've gotten to the point where we almost prefer the night. Mm -hmm. Okay, got another question right here. Or which CVS will, we prefer the daytime, but that's, yeah. that's okay. <laughs> it is prettier, yeah. I, I will give you that. Um, two quick ones for me, uh, and I know this isn't about, a, this isn't a dragon briefing, obviously it's, it's, it's Starliner. But are there any things in your minds that are clear advantages that Starliner brings to the table? Uh, things that you particularly appreciate in terms of how it flies and how you control the spacecraft, uh, how the crew does that? And secondly, um, can do any of you have any idea what, what sort of TV we can expect from the mission between launch and docking? I know what we get on once it's at station, but is there any live downlinks uh, during the mission that you're aware of, or do they have the capability to do that? Thanks. I haven't talked lately. Um, the, 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 for the second question, there is, with the, the current Starliner for CFT, there is not the capability to do live video downlink. Um, we do have the camera system that you saw on the last flight that will provide streaming video when we're docked to the space station. And that camera system is running during the free flight phases as well. Um, and the crew will actually be conducting some public affair, affair events 
during free flight on uh, both the first and second day of the mission, but they'll be recorded on the video system and then played back um, after we've docked. Um, so there might be some some audio of that that comes down live, but uh, there's for this flight there's no live uh, TV capability um, in the free flight phase. Um, comparing uh, capabilities between Dragon and Starliner, uh, again I have to plead a little bit of of Dragon um, lack of knowledge just because I haven't really worked in depth on those vehicles uh, to really give a good comparison, um, but I can tell you that they are different. Um, and some obvious differences are the fact that uh, Starliner lands on the land uh, versus in the ocean. Uh, Starliner has um, tactile um, hand controllers for manual flying, um, whereas Dragon doesn't. Um, and those are, those are kind of some of the more obvious um, aspects. And they're just differences. They're not, one's not really better than the other, one's not necessarily more capable than the other, but they are different capabilities. Uh, the rendezvous sensor suite is different between the two vehicles. Um, just the way that uh, the two companies have approached how they want to approach and depart from space station um, are also differences. And that, that then factors into how you train the crews, what you focus on with the crew training. Um, and that really rolls into exactly what NASA, of course, wanted with the commercial crew program is you didn't, you didn't want just one spacecraft or one uh, provider that um, you know all your eggs are in that basket. You uh, provide a couple of different capability uh, from a access to space perspective, but you also provide a couple of different venues for industry to um, design solutions in their own way using their own ideas that are um, different from each other. And you you start to have this um, low earth low earth orbit economy that NASA has been talking a lot about, where now you have different um, options if you want to get a ride into space. Um, so we, we are definitely going to be um, exercising those that Starliner has as much as we can. And then maybe the best way to answer your question is going to be after the mission when um, the, the services that are looking to provide access to low Earth orbit can then compare between the two and, and see which of the two menu options, if you will, uh, for accessing space are, are to their liking and meet their mission needs. Thank you, Ed. We do look forward to seeing those live downlinks uh, once they get to the space station. Um, we have a question here in the room in the back. Thank you, Stephen Clark, uh, Ars Technica. Just to follow up on uh, Bill's question, uh, what is the vehicle lacking uh, on this particular flight that doesn't allow you to do the live video downlink? And will that come online, like with Starliner One? And uh, secondly, my main question, um, Mike. Uh, can you talk about the uh, abort modes during ascent? Can you walk me through different abort phases, uh, different types of aborts you would uh, conduct if you have to, hopefully not, uh, at different stages? Thanks. I can answer the first part, and then I'll let Mike do your part. Um, really, the only thing that the system is lacking is just connection from the, the data, the video recorder. Um, to a transmission system. So the transmission um, antennas and the ground stations to receive those transmission transmissions are just not online yet. So the, the capability uh, within the capsule, um, the infrastructure for it is all there. Um, they just We just haven't progressed enough into getting the, the operational post-certification piece to where we have that capability yet. Um, to answer the second part of the question, the uh, aborts, um, so we spent a lot of time working on aborts. Boeing and uh, United Launch Alliance have spent a great deal of effort making a safe system. Um, the, uh, the way aborts work is it's kind of joint between the spacecraft and the launch vehicle. The launch vehicle is monitoring itself, um, and if it needs to abort, it will tell the Starliner to abort. Additionally, we've got um, you know, I've got a team uh, of United Launch Alliance uh, flight controllers that are actually in Denver, and they're reporting to me in real time. And they will tell me if they see an abort approaching, and we can do some things like uh, perhaps abort early if we need to, just to put the crew in better weather over the ocean. It's a very large swath of the world we're flying over. But what you'll hear is that liftoff, as I mentioned earlier, the abort system um, goes active 75 seconds before launch. And then uh, as we lift off and you gain more energy, you uh, land at different places, right? So the, one of the, you'll hear them call the abort boundaries. One of them is uh, CM forward, and that's just um, has to do with um, how 
how the the service modules jettisoned after an abort, but that's still in the in the pad area around uh, Florida. Um, as you get more energy, right when the first stage goes at four and a half minutes, you'll hear ECAL. That's um, East Coast abort landing. They, it's a heritage term. You actually um, end up in the ocean, um, generally east of Cape Cod. Um, and then as you gain more energy, um, you will hear a call for St. John's, and that is uh, in the area of the ocean. Near St. John's, Newfoundland, you'll do a guided landing there. And then once you have enough energy to get up over the North Atlantic, which is by design, vehicles designed to avoid that, um, you'll hear Shannon, um, and uh, that's your Shannon, Ireland. And then once you uh, obtain um, enough energy to make orbit, we have actually got a uh, mode called uh, ATO, or Abort to Orbit, and uh, that'll get the the Starliner, if, if there's a low performance case, the Starliner can burn its own engines and get into uh, into a low orbit um, that's uh, 200 kilometers high. And actually, in a lot of cases, we can, given a little bit of time, we can actually figure out how to get a rendezvous out of that if we need to. But those those are the uh, kind of the top level how abort modes work. So I want to go to our phone bridge because I know we don't have all that much time left. Uh, we'll go to Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Great, thank you. Um, two questions. Um, given the flight rate, is there just one NASA team assigned to Boeing for all of the Star Honor flights in terms of mission control, um, or are there different assignments of different people assigned as you progress from CFT to Starliner 1? And a sec oh, quick second question, in terms of referring to the vehicle on orbit, since there is a name of this spacecraft, Calypso, one you see be referring to it as Calypso or as Starliner as you call back and forth from space to ground? Um, I'll get the first one. So I'll get them both. Uh, hey, the first question as far as the NASA team we, uh, that, uh, that supports Starliner, this is, this is a really good question, actually, because you talk about the flight rate. And Starliner is kind of interesting in that, um, you know, Boeing uh, flies this crewed mission. Um, and uh, the, um, the team that we use, we have a very small core group of people that work this full time, but actually most of the team um, that flies this vehicle does other things, right? Uh, both Ed and I do space station shifts and we do, uh, we've done Artemis shifts and it actually really helps with this flight rate because as a, I'm a guy that does operations, one of the things that's really important for people that does the kind of work that we do is you got to fly things, right? And, it, and it's all about how often you get to fly things. That really builds a team that knows how to manage a spacecraft in space and do it safely. And the way this works out is that we can almost um, uh, ebb and flow on this program um, as we're needed, right? So right now we're coming up to a flight and we surge. When you get into some of the time in between these, uh, whoop, in between these uh, um, year-long missions, we can allocate people to do other things, and that ultimately, um, you know, saves uh, um, <clears throat> resources as far as uh, having a team that otherwise you'd need to have completely stood up to cover, you know, 24/7 ops of a spacecraft that that is free flying only a very um, short uh, short period of time. Um, as far as uh, the naming, what we've been using in all of our simulations is, is Starliner. That's kind of what we're used to and what we've been training. So um, I'm sure the, the, the name that uh, Sonny used will come up, but in general in our training we've been using Starliner, and I think, expect that's generally what you'll hear. Great. So we only have a couple of minutes left, but I do want to get one more question in the room, if it could be a quick one. Yeah, hopefully this will be brief. Uh, Will Robinson Smith for Space Flight Now for Mike. Um, assuming that the airbags deploy as nominally, can you describe what the, the impact the uh, Butch and Sunny will feel like, what that sensation will be? And if one of them only partially inflates or doesn't fully inflate, what the difference for that might be? Thanks. Um, that'd be an excellent question for Butch and Sunny this afternoon because they have both. Um, landed in, well, Butch has landed in a Soyuz, which has got an interesting way of landing, as, as, as we've, uh, we've seen. You know, they land on land, too, and, uh, but they're using uh, uh, rockets instead of airbags. 
Um, but I believe the descent rate is about 25 feet per second. Um, I would say that it's uh, uh, likely a firm landing, but, but uh, you know, the requirements for these vehicles that the, both the NASA crewed vehicles, as far as um, um, the conditions that the crew see at impact is fairly gentle. Um, um, it's it's uh, not going to be, I think, something that is, puts the crew at risk in any way. And that includes with an airbag out, right? All those requirements, um, they're, we call them the health and human performance requirements, but they were all there and the vehicle is certified to do all these things, even with an airbag out. And that was um, part of the requirements um, to, to build it. So I, I suspect it's gonna um, be pretty gentle. Great. Thank you so much. That is all of the time that we have today. Thank you to our awesome briefers for talking about an overview of NASA's Boeing crew flight test mission. As Mike alluded to, be sure to come back at 1 p.m. Central Time, 2 p.m. Eastern, because next we're going to hear from the crew, NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams. We'll see you then. It's a new era of pioneers, star sailors, thinkers, and adventurers. Three, two, one, zero, all engine running.